Hatshepsut gradually constructed the image of her kingly authority. Part 10. The masculinized rulership and the inception of the real corrigency. The thorough analysis of Hatshepsut's portrait sculptures conducted by R. Tefnin revealed a dimension of the evolution of the queen's iconography that transcends the rather simple and maybe simplistic question of male versus female depictions, the issue of the necessarily political references to predecessors and their official image. In this respect, the emergence of the new, definitely masculine iconography of Hatshepsut's power was accompanied by two ideologically very important changes, on the one hand, the reintegration of Thutmus III, who had disappeared from the imagery of royal authority since the pre-coronation ascension of the then-regent queen, and, on the other hand, the soon replacement of Thutmus II by Thutmus I as the legitimizing ancestor of the female sovereign. As we have seen, the decoration of the main sanctuary of the Yezer Yezeru at Dral Bihari substantiates the existence of a transition period, during which both kings, the late husband and the deceased father, coexisted in the ideological discourse of the reigning queen in the context of a selective family commemoration. But later on, that is, on any other monument or part of a monument decorated after, the former vanished and the latter became the one and only royal legitimizing reference of Hatshepsut. This apparently progressive switch might be of interest to estimate the chronology of the evolution we have just considered. First of all, the actual corrigency, that is, with Hatshepsut and Thutmus III representing royal authority together, was certainly effective at the end of year 12, for the oldest preserved dated inscription in both of their names is a rock graffito in Tonga commemorating a military expedition in Nubia and beginning with the mention of that regnal year, third month of Purit, day 12, under the majesty of the perfect god Matkara may he be given life and, under the majesty of the perfect god Menkhepera may he be given life, gathered some arguments suggesting a rather quick process. And, indeed, about two-thirds of the statuary of the Yezer Yezeru belong to the last, fully masculinized, iconographical phase, as well as the overwhelming majority of the two-dimensional decoration of the temple. The statues and reliefs actually datable to the second androgynous and physiognomically individualized style are not very numerous, and the fact that different successive stages are attested within quite small monumental spaces in the main sanctuary area in Drail Bihari as well as in the temple of Buin, again, hints at a rather fast evolution. But the most precise clue is perhaps to be sought in the graffito left by Senenmet in Aswan quarries as we have seen, this graffito dates back to the very end of the Regency period, when the queen behaved iconographically, as well as in her actual commands like a king, adopting epithets, such as the one to whom Ra has given the kingship righteously in the opinion of the Enid so almost certainly during year 7. Though the inscription does not give any explicit information about the destination of the two obelisks Senenmet was commissioned to produce, those two monoliths are in all likelihood to be identified with the first pair of obelisks erected by King Hatshepsut in Karnak, in the middle of the festival courtyard of Thutmas II, at the monumental entrance of the temple. If the project was evidently connected with the memory of Thutmus II, by its architectural context, as well as by inscriptions, a fragment from this pair of obelisks pulled down during the construction of the third pylon, under Amenhotep III still preserves the remains of a dedicatory inscription by Hatshepsut to Thutmus I. This implies that those two obelisks were decorated probably in the same phase as the Bark Hall of the Yezer Yezeru, when Style III was already established, Thutmus III reintegrated in royal iconography and the proper corrigency initiated. In the hypothesis that the obelisks of the festival court were the ones supervised by Senenmet, the parallel with the history of the Wyatt obelisks extracted eight years later in the same quarries. At approximately the same moment of the calendar, and in a period of seven full months suggests that the complete metamorphosis, of King Hatshepsut, from regent queen on the brink to be officially crowned pharaoh with an entirely masculinized iconography reintegrating her young corrigan, would have occurred within a few months, or less than a full year, that is, within regnal year eight. So, the evolution of royal iconography during the first eight years of the reign of Thutmus III can be described, and summarized by the following table. 1. The beginning of the reign of Thutmus III and the Regency period years 15-7 Thutmus III is the nominal king, in whose sole name, everything is officially done. The style expresses a perfect continuity with the preceding reigns. 2. The pre-coronation period, between year 5 and the end of year 7, using systematically her title and status of God's wife of Ammon, Hatshepsut appears in royal iconography in a role normally restricted to the king through two successive steps. 2.1. The association with Thutmus III in the depiction of the official practice of divine cult. 2.2. 2. 
the beginning of the references to and association with Thutmose II to the detriment of Thutmose III, actively through wreck Irvings, and, later on, passively through the latter's subsequent total absence for a while in kingship imagery. With this disappearance, the regent queen insists on her own branch of the royal family, giving an unusually important iconographical place to Princess Neferura. 3. The actual reign of Hatshepsut year 720-21. 3.1. The coronation period end of year, 7 beginning of year 8. Hatshepsut is depicted alone, as a female pharaoh. 3.2. The search for new means of expressing her royal authority year, 7 eighths, rather quickly, the reigning queen initiates a metamorphosis in her iconography, starting to modify her official portrait, according to a new unattested and very personalized visage style too, and, in a second step, entering into a process of masculinization of her own image. In the last stage of this experimentation, when this new visage is fully shaped, and the appearance of Hatshepsut already androgynous, Thutmose III is reintegrated into royal iconography. 3.3. The fully masculinized rulership, imagery and the inception of the actual corrigency years 820-21, with the reintegration of Thutmose III in the official image of royal authority, the female pharaoh appears in a definitely masculine guise, with a new portrait style, synthesizing the two previous ones. And, at the same moment, Thutmose I starts to replace Thutmose II as the legitimizing ancestor of King Matkara. This evolution induces a few factual conclusions. First of all, as mentioned above, there is a plain and unavoidable co-occurrence of three very significant iconographical events at the beginning of the true corrigency. First the invention of the so much debated fully masculine iconography of Hatshepsut which actually took place within a broader metamorphosis, involving a new physiognomic style that appears as a compromise between the official Thutmoside mask and a very personalized face, the reigning queen experimented in a process of asserting her own authority as king. Second, the reintegration of Thutmose III in kingship imagery, after an episode of apparently total disappearance. And third, the replacement of Thutmose II by Thutmose I as the legitimizing ancestor of King Hatshepsut. In addition to the simple chronological link between those three phenomena, the observed evolution implies also a semantic connection. Indeed, the third and last physiognomic style of Hatshepsut's portraits corresponds to an adaptation of her highly individualized visage to the official face of her three direct predecessors, including Thutmose III, who is precisely reintegrated in the image of royal authority at the same moment. As for the exceptional place granted to Thutmose II in kingly imagery of the time, it is also inevitably related to the iconographical situation of his son, since the former replaced the latter during the pre-coronation process. By resurrecting her late husband iconographically, the regent queen used his memory to justify her kingly behavior and claims acting as the one who has become king of Upper and Lower Egypt, while emphasizing the royal dimension of her own branch of the family, including notably their daughter, Princess Neferura. With such an iconographical strategy, she still legitimized herself like a queen, and not yet like a real king, referring to her royal father, as she will do later, with the inception of the corrigency and the emergence of the masculinized style three. From an ideological point of view, when the father replaced the husband in the legitimizing discourse of Hatshepsut, the queen became a full pharaoh, according to the tradition. The phenomenon of disappearance and reappearance of Thutmose III in the image of royal authority, precisely around the coronation of Hatshepsut as pharaoh, cannot be fortuitous, of course, and even strongly suggests a tension between the young king and his regent and the fact that she alternates with him or replaces him again. Sometimes through recurvings in the evocation of the royal relation with the gods, as well as the epithets of the queen such as the one who makes enduring monuments for him as the one who has become king of Upper and Lower Egypt, and perhaps also of her daughter, at the same moment of the reign, indicates a definitely polemical dimension in the attitude of Hatshepsut her royal nephew, officially crowned and recognized as the legitimate king almost seven years earlier. Finally, shortly into the queen's own reign, and thus soon after the shading, or the iconographical obliteration of the role and status of the young king Thutmose III. A crisis clearly occurred in the image of Hatshepsut's pharaonic authority, a crisis in which the female sovereign tried to affirm her personality as pharaoh and that eventually led her to completely waive the iconographic expression of her sexual identity, that is, of one of the most basic defining criteria of any human being. Investigating the sources of Hatshepsut's inspiration in her gradual ascension to the supreme power will help us to interpret and understand these different correlated facts.